Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back talking about sport in your braid, talking about bass guys. We're going to be talking about mono versus fluo. We're going to be talking about can fish actually see your line, both the braid and mono and fluoro, and ultimately just be the great fishing line debate. And I'm guessing we'll probably have no actual outcome from this, uh, but to all be mad at each other and think we're all right. So everyone, uh, introduce yourself. Tony here. Tony, Tony what? What you got to have a some kind of call out? Um, let's see what we're we gonna use today. Tony, who are you, Tony? Yes, the avocado seems to come up a lot. Tony Acevedo, <laughs> like avocado. Okay, I'm digging it. Just switch the C and the B. <laughs> Who's up next? Come on, guys, keep this thing moving. You're killing me. I'll go, I'll, Luke, Luke Simon, and I'll just steal your like diamonds, Joe. We gotta, we gotta, gotta keep that going. You gotta say it like a man, like diamonds. Uh, that's a little <laughs> bit too high for uh, that, that qualification, but we'll go with it. It's gonna be fun to be. You got Wyatt Parcel over here. A lot of people like to say like Wyatt Earp. So, I mean, I am a pretty good caster, pretty accurate. So, uh, I'll say more like Bill Parcel. You're a good coach, so oh, we'll, we'll go with Bill Parcel. <laughs> Uh, Mark Goodson. Uh, I don't have a name yet, nickname. So that, that's something that I'll have to have to think of something real quick. So for the old school people, Mark Goodson Television Production. The Price is Right. We'll call you Mark the Barber since uh, last hey. podcast and uh, Facebook Live. We got Looking to show your your at home haircut where you completely butchered yourself. So yeah, but it's going good now. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get this bad boy started. Uh, let's talk about old school versus new school, first and foremost. And I've got some braid here I'm sporting. If you guys follow a Lunker Dog, and congrats, Lunker Dog. I saw you just hit your 100th episode here recently on your podcast. But, you know, Lunker Dog made fun of a lot of people sporting their braid, you know, talking about putting your braid out your window, sporting your different color braid, got your high-vis braid. A lot of old school guys, they ain't down with braid. So what, what happened? When did all this change? What's the story on mono versus braid? Well, Mark, you probably know better than anybody else. What, what are... You know, I think, you know, it's a good breakdown as, you know, a couple of different dynamics. Um, I'll, we'll talk trolling later because that's its own, its own deal. But, you know, I, I think what anglers have, have tried to do is really push the limits with where they can fish um, as opposed to the, the traditional bank beaters of, of yesterday. Um, you know, they, they want to get, you know, really deep in the heavy cover to, to really get after the fish that aren't being, you know, targeted easily, you know, so they're skipping under docks now. They're, they're getting really, really deep in mangroves. They're, they're, you know, they're getting really, really heavy into the structure. And that's where the mono guys traditionally have, you know, had a hard time, um, you know, really getting into the thick stuff so yeah i'm interested to see what what y'all have to say but i would say that the braid generation really happened about um 15 years ago this is where i really started to see braid really really hit the market hard and back then it was you know the berkeley fire line to just you know traditional power pro you know that style of line that really really started to to hammer the market there's some old dude Right now, praying to God that, you know, his kids are going to know what it's like to have a good old spool of mono. <laughs> I still use it today, baby. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. But, Luke, let's talk about the one test you did on casting because that, that needs to come into play. Uh, how much further you were able to cast a little half ounce or an ounce lead braid versus mono. Yeah, and so I'll, just a, a backstory. So first of all, the reason why Mike Mark came from the tackle industry, so he knows he, he knows based on sales like exactly what's trending. I I've just always been a fishing addict, and I was very slow to transition from mono to braid. Like I was a 
uh, you know, Berkeley, well, I actually have some here. The Berkeley big game, that was my stuff. I loved it. I trusted it. And that's all I use. And I would only do bait casting. I didn't like spinning because just spinning, the, the mono on spinning reels is really not very good. It has a lot of memory. It causes a ton of tangles. You have to replace it all the time. Um, and then I finally, I finally went fishing with some, some guys who really knew what they were doing, and they totally schooled me. And I was using my bait casting rod trying to throw a live bait, you know, a live white bait out. I couldn't throw it with an arm. <laughs> Let me use my strong yeah. hand. <laughs> and so these guys had had braid, had thin braid with the spin, with the spin rod, and they were they were casting like twice as far as me. And it it it, it like really made me mad. I'm very competitive, and so then I was like, man, like I need to I need to figure this out. So I got I grabbed one of my old spinning rods, got some braid, and was blown away by how well it cast. And you can feel better. Like it, to me, braid was the reason why I now I now have switched over to spinning. I now use all spinning rods and reels and all braid because the casting advantage, it is significant. You can cast better, you can feel better, you have better hook sets. In my opinion, if you're using artificial lures and spinning tackle, braid is it should be the, the only thing you should do. Well, Zachary says, I remember getting the original sample prototype Power Pro sent to me for testing, still have a roll. That's, uh, oh. that's old school, dude. Save that bad boy. Yeah. So, um, so again, I was very slow to make the change. I'm now mad that I didn't do it sooner, but, um, but it, it really does make a big difference. And so the test that, that Joe's referring to, so I did a test where I got the same rod, the same reel. I was using weights. So everything was the same except one rod, one reel had, had a braid on it. One had mono. What was interesting on day one. So when they're both brand new, the casting distance wasn't that much different. The, the braid was like 5% further than mono. So it was relatively close. But after you just use mono a couple times, it significantly gets worse to the point where it's like, it, it's, it's, I, can't, I can't say I'm using it well, number one for casting, but mostly for feeling like feeling what's happening. Like with braid, you can feel it's like a little pinfish is tapping at your lure. In mono, you have no clue. And so, uh, so again, if you're using a spinning tackle, uh, I, I think it's, it's a no-brainer to go with braid. John says only losers sport their braid. What color, <laughs> what color braid you got there, guys? And and uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to us too. On that. I've done some some yellow versus green. I think the sporting the braid is for like the the high vis stuff. Where I think that's what that's what Lunker Dog was talking about, where you can see the braid from like a mile away because it's so bright. <laughs> but you buy it to match your reel, like a, a red color. Yeah, that's what I, did, I do. Come I on, Tony. Did that one time, and I will say. For the record, because we've had some insiders, you know, they get in there and, and ask about the, the best color braid. And and I've tried them all. And at one point, remember, Luke, we were fishing with C.A. Richardson. And um, I, was, I wasn't I was on his boat that time. Or we'd switched up and I was on, on your little skiff. And he came by and he's like, Joe, he's like, let me see that. <laughs> and I had bought red braid to match my, my reel. And uh, he ripped me a new one. And what was interesting... I, I, that's the only color braid that I have just had hardly any luck. And, and uh, it's, I don't know what it is. I, and I know obviously red, the deeper you get, it actually like turns black and it's probably one of the worst colors to have. But th that's why I tell everyone, if there's one color to stay away from in, with braid, it would be red and don't ever match your reel. Oh, uh, why it's got some dude. Tr I would I'm do that baby. I've had some, I, I mean, I, I'm fishing in a little bit shallower water here. Usually I'm in the creeks, but I've had a really good days. I mean, even in the winter when the water is really clear with redfish. So, I mean, again, I just don't, I, I don't think color matters too much. And I keep the, the hive is yellow on my reels. This is my favorite color. Um, and I, I never used it until I saw Luke using it. Um, and it just was great for his videos to kind of show where the line was. And I found that when I'm fishing, I can have a better idea of exactly where my line is in the water with the high viz colors. So I can just kind of keep track of things, but that's really, I don't, I don't think there's any invisible color or anything like that, but I mean, I'm sorry to hear that you haven't had much success with the, the red line, Joe. Yeah. Well, see, probably the cause you had, side. yeah, you probably had slam shady on the end. So slam shady trumps the red line. <laughs> I did have the slam shady. I do have right, to. Admit, right, so. That explains it. That explains you know, it. And on the freshwater side, black is a good thing for us, you know, because our, you know, the water is so tannic, you know, so, you know, going back in the day, 
you know, before, you know, Wyatt and Tony were around, you know, some of the popular mono back then was the Cajun, you know, the Red Thunder and all the red monofilament lines, you know, back in the early, early 80s, you know, red and black has have always been a staple in the freshwater market. Um, so I, I'm I'm right there with Wyatt though. I, I, I think that it's mainly a confidence standpoint. Um it, I, I don't know that color is that important, um, but we all we all think it is. Well, C.A. Richardson ruined and killed my confidence, and because of that, I caught no fish on that red braided line, and now it has been completely destroyed. But I think the I think the science on the red is that I can't remember how deep you go, but on that on the book, there's what fish see, and it talks about the color. Copy right here. Yeah, there it is. Um, but red at a certain depth and it's, and it's the first one that loses its color, it basically turns black. So Mark, when you mentioned red and black are staples, like is, if you're, what's the depth, maybe Joe, you can find it. I think it was only like three feet. It was, it was, it was surprisingly shallow that red just loses its color and it appears to be black. Yeah. So, so check the, so hopefully you guys can see that, but the top, these are different flies and this, he's got a bunch of different colors. So you guys can see the color there and it's a lot of reds and oranges this is what it looks like just like 10 feet down wow. I mean, it's, it's all black it's really really crazy um so you know, that, that, that that's also another thing too and not to get off topic but you know some of the most you know heavily purchased lures were bleeding bait lures that had the blood splatter, uh, everything redhead, you know, those have always been one of the top. So it's, it's interesting to see that they go to black. And I think it's, again, more fishermen are, are hooked by the beauty of the bait instead of the, you know, the catching side of the bait. Just uh, one more way that redheads are getting picked on in this world. Yeah, baby. Jeez Louise. Our and Irish so ancestors are, oh, they're angry. Yeah. It's, it's you know, of, oh, go ahead, Mark. Tony, on on your braid, because I know that you do a lot of both, you know, on the freshwater and the saltwater side. Have you always been a braid guy or are you more like on my side where if the bait is going to soak in the water, you know, I'm going to do a slow presentation. I'm going to work a worm on the bottom in freshwater. Do you use monofilament in that? And then for your moving baits, your reaction style of, of casting, you're going to use braid? Well, in freshwater, I started out fishing like really clean lakes, clear lakes, and just fishing mm -hmm. around docks. Wasn't really fishing around a lot of grass. And I mainly use mono, like 12 pound mono. And then I started fishing different lakes, like, like Lake Toho, where it's just all grass. And that's when I started using braid. And I've stuck with the moss green. And, um, you know, even without like a leader, like we use inshore, I just tie my lures directly to the braid and I still catch fish that way. Even with like a jerk shad, just letting it slowly sink to the bottom, still caught some really nice fish that way. So I don't, I don't really think the visibility matters too much when it comes to the braid. I think it's more of a reflection uh, deal because if you notice when braids in the water, sometimes it'll reflect, especially if it's really new and it still has that coat on it. But as it starts to wear out, you don't have that shiny coat on it anymore. And it really doesn't reflect as much. Same thing uh, like fluorocarbon. You know, the reason why it's supposed to be technically invisible underwater is because it doesn't reflect light. And it's usually that reflection that the fish will see, not really the line itself. Or the, the fluoro is refract, the refract, refracted, whatever that term is. It says light going through it because it's the same density of water. Um, the, the reflection, I, I don't, I haven't seen any studies that there's a difference between two. It's the re, the refraction is the core thing. It's like the refractive index is closer to that of, of water. Uh, I don't buy it. Like I, I, I don't. So far, every test I've done on fluoro versus mono, like for abrasion resistance and not strength has totally been, against floor, the more expensive fluorocarbon. So um, I'm just, I'm, I think it's more more hype than, uh, than actual, actual. But, uh, Ooh, yeah. Debate, 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 debate. I want to hear someone explain the difference between reflection and refraction. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah. Refraction is, like, is the light bending when it goes through. 
And then reflection is the light bouncing off back. Let's see, someone please in the comments, uh, give us give us some help here. Going back to uh, what you were talking about, Mark, ever since I switched to braid, that's pretty much all I use. Like I haven't gone back to mono. And if I do want to, you know, possibly reduce the risk of the fish seeing what I'm using, then I'll use a leader, even in freshwater. Yeah, I, I think that's that's one of the biggest problems for us tournament guys is we want to try to eliminate as many tying off sections as possible. So if I can go a direct tie to a lure, that's just one knot that I have to worry about the performance of that holding up. Um, so doing a, a braid to a leader, listen, at the end of the day, I know it works, guys. But but trying to beat that into a tournament angler's head that now I'm going to have two knots, that's this is not a good thing for us. Well, your knots are only as good as the person tying them. So. Yeah, well, like I said, <laughs> like, like I said, <laughs> that's why we don't do it. <laughs> and so, so uh, some question came in um, about the color. So what color braid is, is better or worse underwater? What do you guys think? Why do you use yellow? Tony, you said you, you use green. Mark, you're like black and red. Um, I, I'm a black guy. Um, even when I take standard braid, I will cut a V shape in a marker and paint my line with marker. Interesting. Yeah. See, I've I've had a friend fish right next to me with bright yellow braid and caught a 36 inch snook like on the bottom with all of his line in the water. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. To me, I don't feel like it's really visible. I just stuck with moss green because that's what I've always used. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just like same thing. I use original Power Pro. It was like one of the first ones that went out there on the market and. It's all I use. If I switch to something else, I always have issues. Wind knots, line breaking, stuff like that. Let's let, that came up. Let's talk about that real quick because I don't think we're going to have an answer on the color. Um, but old school Power Pro versus all this new stuff and all these different strands. What's 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 happening here? I'm confused. Every time I go into a store, there's some new type of braid. People sporting the braid. Well, the biggest thing is, you know, I think everyone's trying to manufacture the tightest you know, smallest diameter braid on the market. Uh, there's some stuff out now that, you know, that I've not fished with yet, but you know, on the Seaguar side that, you know, their 10 pound, 15, 20 pound braid, it looks half the size of everything else out on the market. So these manufacturers are, are getting with Honeywell that, you know, produces the, the yarn to make this stuff. They're, they're just making much, much smaller diameter braid now. Um, you know, to me, you know, and again, it's because I use a lot of casting products. I just don't think that braid cast as well as monofilament. Um, and, and the higher carrier. Casting reel or I assume casting reel, a bait casting reel. Uh, hold on, guys, real quick. I need to give myself a note. Note to self, invest in Honeywell. Invest in Honeywell. <laughs> <laughs> Making all um, the yarn for all the braid. Yeah. So the, the, the thing is on the casting reels, you know, the, the more carriers that the braid has, the, the, the finer it will be on the reel. Okay. And I just found that the eight carrier braid for some reason, I don't know why doesn't cast for me as well as a four carrier braid. That's thicker. That's more mono like in size. Um, I, I'll tell you, on a monofilament loaded on my bait caster, I can zing it a country mile. I don't know what it is. It braid just does not cast well on a bait caster. Well, unless it has some weight. What unless kind of cast are you using if you're if you feel that you're getting better distance? Oh, here we go. X Bass Pro here with sixty well, pound braid. I, I actually don't have any braid on a bait caster less than fifty pounds. Oh my. Yeah, going after going after tarpon or something or no two <laughs> two, two to three pound bass. <laughs> bitch, I remember bitch going to they're vicious. <laughs> they are vicious. They got these teeth. Ah. I, I, I just don't understand. And even uh, John uh, John uh, s I uh, mispronounced your name there, but yeah, he's at sixty pound braid and a rubber worm to catch a four pound bass. Please explain that to me and John. I, I'm <laughs> totally mystified. 
You know, it, I think the reels just perform better with the right specs and line size. So on a bait casting reel, because that spool just is a free floating spool, it performs better when you put a 10 pound diameter line to a 17 pound diameter line in the monofilament size. So that's why we use, you know, the 50 pound braid because it fits in that categorical reference of line size. So it's more about the diameter. Yeah, it's a diameter thing for, for me. You know, I've tried 20 pound braid and I mean to tell you, it just, it just doesn't perform well. Yeah, I, I got a, uh, I got a bait caster recently about a year ago and I put, I put mono on it and I couldn't stand it. Like it was shot just cause I couldn't feel anything. And mm. uh, I put 10 pound braid and I really struggled because it was so like, I got a, a, a bird's nest because I haven't thrown casting thing in forever. And it's like impossible to pick those things out. I moved to a 20 pound braid and actually I, I so I, I found the 20 pound was light years better than the 10 pound for casting. I haven't gone any higher than that. Maybe I should try it. Yeah. I'm going to convert you to the 50, you know, 50 pound club. I doubt it, but, uh, Come on. So my take on the heavy line, you know, I, I bass fish as well. And, you know, like Mark said, I had no less than 50 pound braid on bait casters and bait casters. They're basically like a winch. If you're fishing heavy cover, flipping soft plastics into grass, when you, you might hook into, you know, like a three, four pound bass, but you also have to consider, you know, there's a layer of about three feet of hydrilla that's going to, be coming up with that fish and that stuff is not easy to pull in. If you try to set the hook with 10 or 20 pound braid on top of all that grass that's with it, you're going to break that line. If not, you know, lose a fish. So having a heavy line definitely works. And like Mark said too, the thickness of the line, it's more manageable on a bait caster with heavier line. I've got a bait caster with 10 pound braid on it right now. And almost every other cast I'm, ha I'm having issues. So so would you go up to 50 on it? Um, I'd say minimum 30 on the bait caster with what the four strand. Money. What color? Moss green. Oh, okay. <laughs> Same color as lily pads. That's nice. And the, and the, the <laughs> <laughs> actually the same color in my rod too. Ooh, my matching baby. Matching. Matchy, old, matchy. Old school uh, Bass Pro Extreme <laughs> set up here. So I want I want to share a, a quick example that I had last week of some mono versus some braid, and this is with spinning gear, not bait casting gear that you guys are using. I was out fishing against guys that had setups much like this, monofilament line, uh, big heavy reel. We were on the pier, and the difference between me and the guys that were on the pier was I was able to cast further with the ten pound braid, and that's where all the fish were. So I was catching two, three times as many fish on the pier as the guys with mono because I could get out further. So again, we were talking about diameter. I, I don't know if it would be different if they had, had bait casting reels, everyone was using spinning gear. But I think the big difference with spinning gear is that if you have the smaller diameter line, you're getting out to cast further. And we all know that the person that gets their lure in front of the most fish's face is going to be who catches the most fish. So I think Saltwater wise, I know there's not much hydrilla floating out in the middle of the beach. Saltwater wise, I'm going to side with the 10 pound braid as my main line just so I can cast further, uh, like Luke was talking about. And that's a great video that you had with the, uh, the 20 pound versus the 10 pound. But I mean, imagine 30 pound mono versus 10 pound braid. So I mean, I I'm getting four or five times as much distance with my cast than everybody else. And I'm catching three, four times as many fish. Yeah, and the, the experiment why I mentioned, yeah, so we did a, a experiment, again, same rod, same reel, same weight, one spool with 10-pound braid, the other with 20-pound braid of the same manufacturer. So try to limit everything, as many variables as possible. And the 10, the 10 pound braid casted 20% further on average than, than the 20. And so mathematically, every, it was every, I think it was like 15 to 20 casts it's an extra football field of coverage of distance coverage. That's huge. Like there's, there's nothing that we can control more than that, that can guarantee that we're going to catch more fish because not only is it a football field, that's a lot of distance. But that's going to be the best strike zone because those fish, especially if you're fishing like shallow flats, those fish have the least amount of awareness that dangers in the area. So you've, you've increased again, a football field of ideal strike zone, 
every every 20 or 15 to 20 casts. Um, not much else can guarantee more fish caught than that. But yes, you know, if you do, if you are fishing tighter structure, um, then that can be a downfall because, you know, the fish have an advantage once they're hooked. But uh, for that reason, that's why I do 10 pound braid on most everything. And then if you are fishing structure, there's some tricks you do. Like if, if you can feel it, cause with the braid, you can feel everything. As soon as you, I start feeling that it's rubbing around a dock piling or anything, like Tony has the coolest video ever. Um, and Tony was that, that was 10 pound braid, right? Where you have that big snook. Yeah. yeah so 10, you, 10 pound. Yeah. So as soon as you feel, um, something rubbing on structure, your instinct is to pull back harder. I've done it. I've lost a lot of fish. That's the best way to break the line. <laughs> the, the, the trick is to actually give it, um, less tension. And then, uh, in many cases, like Tony, Tony, if you haven't seen that video, watch it. It is, it is absolutely amazing. But in many cases you can get some really big fish on light line, even if they're getting up around pilings. And these saltwater pilings have barnacles, unlike the, the freshwater weed, there's no, no shark stuff at all. So I'll never be sold on 60 pound bread for bass. <laughs> I'm going to make you a believer. Come on. <laughs> yeah, we need to go fish. I, 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 I just blows me away. I, I've never understood that. You know, but, but there are cutoffs in, in freshwater though, because as you understand, a lot of the fishing that we do, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a bank beater. Uh, that's never been my style of fishing. I, I like fishing offshore and, and what I target offshore are the muscle, you know, the muscle beds, you know, because the fish love that hard bottom. So whenever I'm doing a lot of cranking, I, I have the same cutoff points as well. But, you know, another thing too, what, what also kind of helps me determine the line is the combo that I'm using. You know, some of my crankbait rods that are fiberglass rods, um, you know, I, I like the traditional soft stretch mono um, versus the braid. Um, you know, cause when that fish hits that, that really, really parabolic rod that I use for cranking, you know, I want to give it as much give as possible. Um, and again, you know, on the freshwater side, I don't switch out my hooks, you know, to the single replacements. So I'm using a lot of treble hooks and I find that braid just, it just rips the mouths of bass when you put a little bit of heat on them. So, you know, again, another reason why I use a lot of monofilament in tournaments. I love uh, the bass guy's nomenclature. So we're going after three to maybe seven pound fish. You got 50, 60 pound braid. We're talking offshore. I'm envisioning offshore and a lake is like close enough to the dock where you can tell your wife you're going to still be home at 730 <laughs> for dinner. Yeah, honey, I'll be back. I'm offshore. <laughs> Look, what, offshore, what are you talking about? Think about it. Okeechobee is 33 miles wide. That's taking a bass boat 15 miles offshore to go crankbait fishing. So again, Okeechobee is a rare scenario because of how big it is. But offshore fishing to me, I'm in seven and a half to 10 foot of water and I'm cranking. On Okeechobee, you can be in three to four foot swells too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Been there, Okeechobee is its own, its own monster for sure. Uh, uh, so let's... Uh, let's We've talked a lot about, you know, braid. I know there's been some questions here about leader line. And Luke, you and I did a little podcast uh, about that. And we both we both beat it up pretty hard. And, and we use both, FYI, uh, you know, fluoro and, and mono. But there's been a kind of a big shift uh, with, with a lot of inshore saltwater anglers who are now starting to use more mono, including a lot of captains. Uh, you want to address the reasons why? Well, again, I think I made this switch once I actually started doing tests because for many years I was, you know, tournament fishing and I had cigar. I was going out getting the, like the expensive, the expensive floor car, like the blue label cigar was my, that was it. Like that was my trust. Like that was, that was like the, the one thing that I was okay. I, like when I had that, that's my confidence thing. I knew, Hey, this is the best. Everybody's talking about it. It's on TV. It's in the magazines. It's highly touted as number one. And I, in my mind, it was stronger it was less visible. Yeah, I, I knew I didn't buy the invisible stuff. It, it, clearly, you can see it in the water. It was less visible than mono. It had better abrasion than anything else. And it had better knot strength because that, those were all highly touted across the industry. And then I started actually testing, uh, you know, testing the knot strength is easy, right? Just, just 
pull it and, and get a, a basic scale and you can see you can see that it's uh, what the braking strength is so that was worse than mono and then i built a, a test assembly to uh, test the abrasion resistance where I, I rubbed the lines on sandpaper with the same exa- amount of tension to see how long it took to break and every single time 100 percent of the time traditional monofilament won against fluorocarbon and gets the more expensive fluorocarbon and not only on uh, so a 20 pound first i did it with a 20 pound mono and a 20 pound fluoro mono one but mono pretty much all monos traditional monofilament are actually thicker than than fluorocarbon so then okay like maybe it was the diameter was the difference on the abrasion so i got a 20 pound mono against a 25 pound fluoro the mono still be the fluoro so after that like i'm I don't know. I, I just think that the fluoro is, is just too hyped up um, because a lot of people think that all three of those factors are true. I, I still haven't proven one way or the other, the invisibility factor, uh, but that's coming up soon, but it's, it's proven so far, at least on the tests I've done. And uh, I'd be curious if anyone else has done it, let me know. But on tests, the knot strength and the abrasion strength, fluorocarbon is worse than the much less expensive monofilament. So that's, that's why I made the switch, personally. Mono also stretches more than fluorocarbon, so it acts as a better shock absorber, especially if you're, you know, fishing for trout and even snook. You know, the more pressure that's on the line, the more likely that fish is going to rub through that leader. So if it has a little bit more stretch, and I've actually found that, you know, mono is softer than fluorocarbon as well. So it, like Luke said, it's a bit more abrasion uh, resistant. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. And also, I believe a lot of captains have switch, uh, switched over just because it's more cost effective. It's cheaper than fluoro uh, to use mono because they're, you know, switching lines out daily, if not hourly. <laughs> so not wasting too much money there. Yeah, if I switched about 15 years ago, I saw a video of a guy down in the Keys who literally put a, you know, jagged rock on the countertop. And he's like, I'm, let me show y'all what I mean by, you know, a mono versus braid test. And he used back then, it was Andy backcountry. Um, it was like a bluish kind of, you know, line in the Florida Keys, huge down there. And he took that monofilament across that jagged rock probably 20 times. And then he took 50 pound braid and it snapped almost immediately. I mean, one, two passes and it was done. So, you know, and, and matter of fact, you know, Luke may remember this, but whenever he and I originally met, you know, three years ago, give or take, um, you know, I, I always was a monofilament guy, leader guy. Um, I always told my grouper guys, if you're going to braid fish, use monofilament leader. Every single time I've ever done a seminar at a boat show, it has always been mono leader, um, you know. I, again, I'm not a big fluoro guy. And as a formal, you know, former tackle store owner, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's more money to the store. So, you know, it, it was kind of a disservice by not educating, you know, the, the general public for pros and cons. Um, tackle stores made more money and manufacturers made more money, um, you know, but at the end of the day, like the, the line that Luke held up earlier, you can buy a, a thing of, of Berkeley big game or Trilene big game, um, you know, at Walmart for seven bucks and have several hundred yards. Yeah, for six, <laughs> yeah, 660 yards was around like six, seven bucks and a 25 yard spool of cigar blue label, which I, I swore used to swear by was like $20. So it's mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's almost a dollar a yard of line. And now you can get 600 yards for seven bucks, it's a very big price difference. Mark, Mark, what did you see in terms of uh, when when these manufacturers started coming out with fluoro leader versus you know just a, a bigger spool of fluoro mainline? What, what happened with sales? Um, I no, talked uh, about what happened in terms of Luke's test, but were, were people flocking to that even though it was a lot more expensive? You know, fluoro line really hasn't taken off per se, you know, as a main line, you know, some of the guys that want to target yellowtail and ultra, ultra clear water, or some of the fisheries that just have gin clear water, you know, they're, they're taking exactly what Luke just said, 
you know, the, the industry kind of force feeds you everything that they want you to believe that the line is. Okay. So that, the the suppleness of, of a mainline fluorocarbon, and then you need this ultra abrasion resistant leader material. So the, the industry is just force feeding you everything that you need to know about it. Um, when the manufacturers started creating leader material, it just skyrocketed their sales because they wanted fluorocarbon to work so well for the industry because they were making a mint from it. Uh, and, and the main line fluorocarbon just never really got there. So they said, how can we really push this to the market and make considerable amount of money? You know, here pops up the, the 25 yard spools of, of leader material. And, and like Luke said, you know, you're, you're talking $25 for a small spool of line that really isn't the strongest application out there. It, it, it literally works. Like, and again, unless, unless it somehow proves to be like way less visible, um, then like it's, it's actually a step in the wrong direction. Like in, unless you're in super clear water, I can, I can understand, but like in most, most of us fish, you know, inshore waters where it's a greenish tint or if not just flat out murky. And in that, in those scenarios, like I, I recommend against fluoro just because, just because again of the abrasion and the knot strength is worse and it's, it's way more expensive. So being that this is the great fishing line debate, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I've noticed something up in my, my murky Carolina waters. I've used both mono and fluoro. And like we talked about earlier, monofilament has a thicker diameter than fluoro does when the strength is, uh, is the exact same. So me wanting to keep my strength, but in the murky waters where fish might be able to pick up on vibrations more because they have less sight. It's almost like if someone loses their vision, their hearing gets better. So those fish being in that murky water, they might sense vibration more. And if I want to keep the same level of strength and I'm using that 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon leader instead of the 12 to 15 pound mono for those trout that are really sensitive, they feel those vibrations in the water. It, some, sometimes I side with the fluoro. Again, this is me playing devil's advocate and I've caught fish with both, but that is another consideration to have on Flora's side. Yeah, again, I, I mean, I tested the, the 20 pounds mono versus the 25 pound fluoro and the fluoro's diameter was actually like a tad bit thicker. So like a, you know, a, a diameter to diameter test. If anything, the bray or the fluoro had a, had a thicker diameter, um, the mono still won. So, I, I mean, I'd say if you want, if you're going by diameter, just get the same diameter and mono and, um, and on the abrasion spectrum and probably the knot strength too. I haven't tested the knot strength on the 20 versus the 25 fluoro, uh, but on abrasion in particular, that regular, regular mono, uh, at least proved to win on the test I did. All right. Yeah, I agree. Our boy, Jeff Maggio, Lunker Dog. I just saw him pop on. Jeff, we gave you some shout. We were sporting our braid earlier, dude. <laughs> All kinds of colors up in. Happy birthday, by the way, too. Yeah, happy birthday, Lunker Dog. Woo, baby. So I, I saw in the beginning quite a few people said, I only fish with J Braid. What's all this J Braid about? Di it's Daiwa stuff, right? Yeah, J Braid. You know, it's kind of, you know, one of the very first braids to really start reducing the the product cost to consumers. What did so they do it came differently? In, um, it, it just imported it and decided that they were gonna, you know, bring something out to the market that was relatively inexpensive. You know, um, as far as, you know, the, the quality of the product, uh, again, I still think J braids strongest line, uh, is the fork carrier. Um, it just, I, I've, I've used both, you know, the eight strand and the four strand, and I just seem to have better strength with the four. Can you explain um, to everyone what the difference is in these counts, fours and eights? So it, all it is is just, just imagine, you know, you having eight lines in your hand that you're going to braid the line together with. So the more, you know, the more lines that you use um, is the, the strands that we're talking about. Uh, some manufacturers have a core set and then they wrap the braid around the core set. Uh, you'll start seeing a lot of that with Suffix, for instance, you know, when they have their Gore-Tex uh, line as their core set. Uh, but most of the stuff, again, is all is all Honeywell, you know, fibers, just like that. Um, most eight, of the stuff. Eight braided fibers, fibers, fiber, 
32 weaves per inch. Yeah. How can you beat that, Mark? How can you say yeah. that four is stronger than eight? Yeah, it's, you know, what, what eight does is it really makes everything tighter. Um, so if you want something that has less noise that's supposed to come off the reel, um, you know, faster, slicker, um, you know, that's that's the whole buzz of the eight carrier stuff. And, and, and you know, a lot of these braid manufacturers, I don't know if y'all have ever seen a braid weaving machine, um, but we, we've seen videos and I'll, I'll have to dig them up so I can post them on Salt Strong um, from Finn's Wind Tamer facility. And BBS Technology, Fins as a company, actually produces braid for several manufacturers. Most people don't understand that. They think that they each line company kind of makes their own stuff. That's not the case. There's, you know, four, four major companies across the world that makes everyone's braid. And talking about Fins, for instance, um, they'll just load it up and they just have all these rotating arms that braid everything into this you know, to the line. Um, it's, it's just impressive to see how fast these little, the, the little armatures just turn and, and create that woven product. Um, pretty neat. I'll, I'll have to dig up that video so I can post it. So y'all can see how it's actually made. Uh, it all starts from fiber. Are they all buying their materials from this Honeywell group again? Yeah. Honeywell's oh. the largest producer. Oh. Note to self, double down on Honeywell <laughs> stock today. Yeah, they're the largest producer. You know, they, they have now created the finest, you know, yarn, you know, to, to be utilized in the braid industry. Um, and Fins actually just started producing, I'd say about two and a half, three years ago, a product called 40G. And that 40G is using the finest yarn made by Honeywell as a brand. Um, and what it does is it, it takes out all the air, it takes out the size and the volume of the line. And that's how some of these new companies like, you know, the, the um, uh, cigar product that just came on the market last year, that's how they're making these braids so much smaller in diameter now is because they're using that higher end, you know, yarn from, from Honeywell. Is that what like Max Quattro is using? I think it was, uh, is it, Berkeley, I think there's who makes that? Yeah, Max Quattro is Power Pro. Power Pro. Yeah, yeah. So that's Power Pro's kind of higher end series of braid. It's a cool and name. So that's like a cool name for a dog, Max Quattro. <laughs> <laughs> so if if Fins is making a lot of lines for other carriers, I mean, mm -hmm. it is Fins. That Fins is one I really haven't tested much since they're actually making them. I mean, is theirs going to be better than the others because there it's kind of have control over quality? I'll tell you, Dave, who owns the company, he um, he's just one of those unique guys that just know everything about everything when it comes to braid. You know, he knows the tinsel strengths. He knows what kind of fillers. He knows everything that there is to know on the deal. And someone that I suggest, you know, you know, next time Joe and, and yourself have a podcast, you know, to really listen to this guy because he is he's amazing. Um, he loves talking about how the line is made. Um, but to answer your question, every company um, will tell him the specs that they want to see in their line. OK, and, and they'll they'll kind of give him, you know, the platter full of goods and say, Dave, make me this product. And, and I would think that, you know, being the owner of the whole deal, I would think that Finns would still be, you know, the, the upper echelon of quality. Um, I've personally used Finns Windhaver and I love it. I think it's a fantastic product. So how many different companies are they white labeling for? You don't have to name names unless you want to. Yeah, they, he, he won't even name them. Um, and kudos to him, you know, for, for being discreet about that. Um, but I, I was told at one time that it was eight companies that he was manufacturing for. That's crazy. Um, doesn't surprise me, though. Yeah. So I've seen some talk about wind knots. Do we want to talk about that topic? With braid? I think it's huge. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest reasons why people don't switch to braid. You know, they put it on a spool and their first cast to get screwed up and they just say, forget this stuff is junk. But there, there's a lot of factors that come into play. We actually have an article um, on wind knots and there's, I believe I have 10 or 11 different things that you want to be aware of to help prevent wind knots. 
And what it really comes down to is the speed of your line leaving your spool and then leaving the rod tip. If there's any drastic change in speed between you know, the spool and the rod tip, your line's going to catch up to itself and it's going to tangle up. And that's the reason why most people get wind knots. Like, or, like knots going through the guides this is probably one of the big reasons. Yeah, like your leader, for example, that leader knot, if you reel it up into your guides, so you go to cast, the line behind the leader is coming off the reel pretty fast. And the line that just left your rod tip with that leader has slowed down because it's hit those guides on the way out. So that line behind it is going to catch up to the line in front of it. And it's basically going to overlap itself and tangle up. So tell me how, how much you would like to do that during a tournament. <laughs> yeah, you know, now you see the mono baby. No, you just use an FG nut. <laughs> yeah, just, don't, just don't reel the knots in the sky. Because that's a real, that's a very easy one to, uh, to dodge. Yeah. Also uh, flimsy rods, rods that are very, you know, like have a moderate action. And if you go to cast them really hard, what's going to happen is that rod tip is just going to keep bouncing as that line's coming out. And again, it slows your line down. The line behind it catches up to that line that's leaving uh, the rod tip and it just tangles itself up. So, I mean, as long as you keep that in mind and understand how and why that happens, you can help avoid that. And another one, keep intention on the line. Like as you're reeling it, it's, it's a huge mistake to ever reel it when at, without some sort of tension. It doesn't have to be much. Just, just if there's any loop in that spool, your next cast is going to take that loop. It's going to take more than one strand off at the same time. And that's, that's game over. That's what so, it's so Wyatt, what he's actually saying, Wyatt, is you have to manually close your bail you have to apply tension to your line. You can't cast very hard because your rod loads and unloads too fast. You get wind knots. Can we make a better case than using monument, you know, monofilament than that? Well, oh, how about bird's nest? How about a bird's nest if you try to cast too far? No, oh, bird's nest with a bait caster. Y'all are proving my point. The mono guys are shining right now. now I, I, how often are you spooling your reels, though? Well, see, that's another debate, too, because some of the cheaper monofilament, it's constant. I mean, every single month I was having to put new line on there. But, you know, I'll, I'll say a brand. And again, as everyone knows, listening to these podcasts and anything that we do, we're not sponsored. So I'm just going to tell you what I have found to be very, very good product. And that is the Suffix Elite and Suffix Siege. Probably one of the best winding on their, you know, their filler spools whenever they make it at the factory, probably the best technique as a manufacturer that I've ever found. And what I've found that it has hardly any memory on a bait caching reel, um, that G2 winding precision that they do is just the smoothest line loaded onto a spool. Some of the cheap stuff, I'll tell you, man, um, I've seen some pretty gnarly line after about three weeks of sitting on a bait casting, you know, reel. It's terrible. Terrible. Yeah, suffix is what I used to use back in the day. It was a red yeah. packaging. I forget which yeah. one it was. Yeah. Yeah. The, the red was the elite and blue was the siege or vice versa. I don't remember, but I used the blue and I'm telling you, it was great. What's from the stuff that I have here? This is from like, an old eye cast they gave it to me that's that's the braid there right that's braid yeah do you use this at all the suffix i don't no. it pops too easy yeah i like I pulled some out i i can't tell that much of a difference um that's the eight carrier right joe yeah this is the eight yeah. the gore performance fibers yeah i put some of that on i've been i've been using that actually the past couple of weeks um i usually do power pro it's 10 pound first 10 pound and i can't tell it's definitely a little bit smoother to the feel I feel like it's thinner as well. I, I can't really tell a, a difference in casting distance. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't yet like had any big fish on your structure yet uh, with it. So I don't know about the abrasion, but um, I can't really tell that much of a difference so far. Well, Mark, Mark you mentioned um, suffix in terms of how they're spooling it at the factory. Talk about, I mean, you were there in the tackle store. And I know you guys at, at Southeastern there. And you guys will, will obviously spool up people's reels with uh, with new line talk about the importance of that I, I had you guys do that one you know eight hundred dollar reel just because i wanted it to be absolutely perfect and dude it i mean it was so stinking tight uh, talk about some of the mistakes that are made when people are uh, spooling up their with braid or mono uh for their first time 
You know, I, I'll say this as, you know, a precursor to the things, you know, using a machine to put line on isn't always the best scenario. Matter of fact, it's never the best scenario if you know how to put line on yourself uh, because line will naturally come off a spool when when you do it in a lineal, you know, motion for bait casting and or sideways motion, you know, and let it come off naturally to a spinning reel. So nothing will mimic a line going onto something or off of something unless you manually do it yourself, number one. Um, but in today's world, that's just not the case. I mean, let's just face it. It's all about time, put something on there. And then whenever I get onto the water, I'll dump the line myself and then manually do it myself. So if you ever go fishing with me, you know, especially offshore, I'll cut my lures off. I'll dump, you know, a hundred yards of line off of my reel and then manually reel it back on real quick to eliminate twists, to eliminate how it was put on by machine. You know, I, I do that almost every trip. Um, you know, but as far as the line machines go from the manufacturing of the actual equipment, you know, the way that they tell you to do it is when you have a spool of line, the line is on the top side um, coming off of the real spool. I mean, the, the line spool itself onto a casting or conventional. And then the opposite occurs on a spinning. The line will come off the bottom side of that spool um, and then, of course, rotating around the spool. Um, the manufacturer of the line machine has different braking levels on the, you know, tension of the line coming off and onto a spool. So, you know, those are kind of, you know, already factored in as well. But, you know, the biggest thing is, is you know, loading up based on the parameters of the spool, uh, not overfilling the spool. I see that a lot of cases, too, is they put too much line on in some cases. Um there's no, and, and this is so everyone can hear, there is no such thing as a braid ready spool. Okay. That's a news flash. I don't care what any manufacturer says their spool is braid ready. The rubber band that manufacturers put on every spool is glued on. When that salt water starts to eat away that glue, that band will not hold true to that aluminum spool over time. Um, so it's always good to back every reel with monofilament because it will grab aluminum so much better than braid ever will. Um, I don't care if it's only five yards, five feet. Just grab it with something that's that's good. I'm not a big fan of tape. Again, that adhesive, you know, adhesive, adhesive material on tape just it just comes undone. You know, over time, we, we, you know, when you're putting it on a lot of water scenarios, your line, your whole spool gets saturated, and it, tape will just break down. So just put monofilament on as a backer, load it with braid, um, and then let the tension of the machine do its job. Yeah, and the reason for that, in case somebody know, I, we have this question coming pretty often: is that if braid is on the on the spool and on the arbor itself, it, it has the risk of of not having enough friction to hold, and so like so your drag is meaningless because the 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 line is actually rotating around the entire arbor, and you can't reel anything in. So it's, okay. it's game over. Like if that happens, it's game over. Um, and so, and in my mind too, I use such a light braid that I have way more than enough, even like with a 2000 size reel, I actually put a, I put a good amount of mono on just to, just to not, you know, not waste the, the same waste that, that, uh, that section on the more expensive braid. And do y'all flip your spools? Do y'all, do you know, do you just swap around and use the bottom as the top now? And I used to, I don't need more now. I, uh, I just braid it. I, I spool it and I walk out a hundred yards and cut it and then tie it. And then every other re-spool, I just, I just peel off a hundred yards and I just replace the top hundred yards. So that way I get a, I get a 300 yard spool and I know every time it's going to be exactly 300 yards. And every time I get up to the right amount, you know, it, it'll, it'll fill the spool properly. So I kind of burn one the first round. And after that, it's exactly hundred yards every time. You know, something that you said last week that kind of floored me, you know, there is no way I would have braid on a reel as long as you've had braid on your reel. Uh, again, it's just a, a, a personal thing, uh, an issue with me. If, if I know that I have two year old braid on a reel, three year old braid on a reel, I just I just it, it breaks me down mentally. You know, <laughs> there's I, I just know that this line's going to fail because it's old, you know, so to mindset. me. 
Yeah, I go a year and a half. But I mean, as long as uh, as long as there's enough on there, like uh, I started the, the gap on the spool is important. So it's like a about a sixteenth of an inch of a gap between the edge of the line and the edge of the spool, the top edge, of course. Um, and so as long as there's enough distance where, because as that gap gets wider, your casting performance is, goes down because it just the braid has to travel further to get off the spool. Um, but as long as I have enough line there and, and my, my braid isn't actually like showing frays, I'll keep rocking it. Like I've, I have some power pro with that's over a year and a half old. I was in that tournament, Tony, that we fished. I had a year and a year and a half old power pro on there. Yep. He also has his uh, boxer shorts from high school. So, uh, <laughs> doesn't get rid of things easily. <laughs> yeah. I think it just more depends on like the line itself. If I see that the line is frayed up, you know, you can see little strands sticking off of it, then I'll switch it out. Um, and another tip too, for just knowing how much backing to put on your uh, spool. If you have two identical reels, what you can do is actually put the line on backwards, put the braid on first, fill it up with, you know, 150 yard spool. If you want 150 yards on there and then fill it with the mono backing. And then now take that spool and basically put the opposite on, you know, tie the backing to your other spool on your other reel and you can fill your reel up that way. So, you know, you have enough line on there. We were talking about line age. This, this rule got, or this reel got spooled in college. Uh, I think like my freshman year. So it is the oldest braid that I own and I'm still catching fish on it. I, is at least three years old, if not more. I can't yeah, remember exactly. I was going to say, yeah. for the record, you're still in your twenties. Uh, uh, yeah. I was about to say for the record, he's in a sophomore year right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's old braid, but it works. It works just fine. And there's no phrase in it. I use it for surf fishing. So, I mean, I get, I get really good distance with it, Mark, which I wouldn't get with mono, but it, it holds up really well. Yeah. yeah my, my, oh, sorry. I was going to say my, uh, my Speaking of like that, that reel, I've, I've used with the camera, the underwater camera to get that strike footage. So I've been casting that. It's like a $200 camera. I, mean, I sling it out with this rod. And it's the, Joe, it's that, it's the same setup that we had on March Madness when we first started Salt Strong like five years ago. Dang. And I actually had it at least two years before that. So now it's seven years old and it's 20 pound power pro. So, and it's, I'm still rocking it. And, uh, and I, I, I have enough faith where I'm slinging as far as I can cast, you know, a $200 camera. And again, it, cause it's not frayed up. Like I don't use it that much. I, I mostly use the, uh, the inshore stuff, but, um, but I'll keep using it as long as it, but you know, as long as it just looks like it's not all knocked up and I haven't got, if it goes around a piling, I obviously inspect it. Cause if you have one Nick on there, game over. Um, but just, yeah. just kind of be careful with it. If you get around structure, always check. And then if you see any bad spots, cut it out and, uh, and keep using it. And then once it gets too low, then I just, then I just replace it. So Wyatt up in your area, cause you and I were talking, you know, off the, off the screen about uh, your new combo that you were wanting for surf fishing and king fishing. Are your guys still using braid up there for kingfish? Because so, down, down here, a lot of the guys are using mono because of how thin the mouth is. It, de- it here's the thing. It depends. We're fishing off piers. So if they're trying to launch their anchor line, yes. But if they're, it's on their, their live bait line where they need the shock because there's so much weight on there, they're using mono. It really, it's a big personal preference. When I'm launching artificials off a of pier, I need that braid so I can get that distance. But if I'm using those live bait setups, I've got mono, but if it's the anchor line and I need to get it out far, I'm using that braid. So I've got my two surf and and pier fishing setups here. This is my close to shore setup. This is, it's got mono on it. This is my long, if I'm trying to reach that second sandbar, I'm using this guy right here. Cause it's again, thinner diameter casts way better um, than, than the mono does. But there's another factor with surf fishing is your, your abrasion on the bottom. Uh, and if I'm fishing close to the shore, generally those waves are going to push the line close to the bottom. There's a lot of shells going around. So I really like the mono. So there's, there's a high vis mono. It looks bright yellow from here. You're right. It is high vis mono. You can see it. It's uh, it's suffix actually, Mark, I agree with you. I really like suffix as mono. Um, but, uh, I, I will, uh, why well, I, I sport his mono now he's sporting his mono. Whoa. I told you baby conversion. I, it's only for surf fishing. I swear. I, and I, I, I when I use, a. Uh, Fluoro or mono for a leader. I mean, I, I use Andy. I like Andy for the leader material a little bit better, but suffix mainline 100%. Cool. Well, guys, this has been good. I see we've gone over an hour. We could probably, and I still have like a ton of bullet points that we didn't even get to talk about. So uh, we'll continue this great debate. And I know, Luke, you've got these underwater contests coming 
really soon. And uh, where Luke's going to be taking different lines, both monofluoro different brands, and taking them underwater, different depths, different types of water clarity to see exactly what you can or can't see. Uh, ultimately, just trying to see, you know, if any of these are invisible, which we know the answer is pretty much. Yeah, no. None of them are invisible. Uh, there should be no debate there. It's which ones are least, are, least. are less visible than the others. So I have like from the high-end stuff, like the um, the the Seagar Gold, somebody mentioned that, got some of that. I It was killing me to spend, you know, 25 more do- or more dollars on 25 yards of line. That just baffles me. Uh, also got some of the less expensive Floros. And then I have some traditional monos. Like obviously Berkeley Big Game will be in there, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, but again, we'll see. We'll just film it, different different backgrounds on dark bottoms, light bottom, looking up, looking down, um, and see just see what what it looks like. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. And then finally, if you guys are planning on spending any money on tackle over the next year, you'd be crazy not to join us in the Insider Club. We now have twenty percent off everything. Rods behind me. If you're watching this on the tube, reels line both braid and mono and floral and leader line and uh lure slam shady got alabama leprechaun if you guys haven't got your packs i i believe we just ran out today and we have more coming uh we anticipated this being a top seller this uh this is that alabama leprechaun jerk shad that's got the custom scent you can't buy this in stores and uh if you haven't got yours you can go to saltstrong.com slash bama and even if we're out for a few days, you can put your email in and we'll notify you when it comes in. But I'm, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping we're going to have these things coming in very, very shortly. I saw a text from Carol while we were on, and I, I know she's been watching it closely. And then finally, come join us in the club. We're now uh, 13,000 plus strong. Uh, all of us are in there every day. I was spending about an hour on there prior to this in the private community, putting up all kinds of, of content that you can't find out there on YouTube. And, and most importantly, just sharing shortcuts, sharing trends, sharing what's working right now in your area. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. Definitely like a family and positive, no cursing, no belittling, no negativity. It's, uh, man, it's just been an awesome group to be a part of. And uh, even better when you can save 20% off everything. I've seen quite a few thousand dollar plus orders come in. And uh, so there's 200 bucks off of, uh, of that order uh, alone. So it's uh, been cool to see that and cool to see all these discounts going out. So guys, thank you so much for all the love, all the support. You can find out more about the Insider Club at saltstrong.com. And as I mentioned, if you haven't grabbed your Alabama leprechaun, that's at saltstrong.com forward slash Bama, B-A-M-A. Otherwise, we are out. Good job, guys. Peace. Peace. See you guys. Cause fish in a tin mine